approximate memory in C and C++ code. Uh, so the background is the memory wall problem where the performance gap between memory subsystems and CPUs have been increasing, uh, dramatically increasing because the performance of CPU, which means floating point operation per second, has been exponentially growing, while the performance of memory subsystems, which means the uh, uh, random access latency in this particular talk, has been almost flat more than a decade um, due to various reasons. So uh, here comes approximate memory. Which this is a new technology that can alleviate this issue. And um, this is one of the examples uh, of approximate, approximation that was in the, uh, which was also in the keynote. And this uh, technology can achieve lower latency and lower energy uh, with a cost of higher possibility of bit flips or errors. I'm gonna use the words bit flips and errors uh, interchangeably in this talk. And this is expected, expected to be particularly useful for AI and big data and some of the HPC workloads because again, uh, as, as in the previous uh, keynote, some um, input is you know, by nature noisy and also the human being that interpret the output is also like, you know, not very accurate, right? And because of the, uh, um, this, this big problem and big um, uh, expectation, there, there's been much work on um, approximate memory, as you can see in the ready work and also in the references of the paper. You can check some of them if you're interested. And one of the methods to uh, implement this approximate memory is actually to relax timing constraints of um, DRAM internal operations. So uh, what is a timing constraint? Uh, so a memory controller, which is pretty much um, embedded in a CPU today, um, uh, sends a command to DRAM at a time, and before sending the next command, it has to wait for some amount of time that is specified in the um, uh, the JDEC specification that um, specifies you know everything about DRAM, and this uh, the amount of time that you have to wait for is uh, called for uh, a timing constraint. And the, the, at the bottom is the, the the figure shows the uh, uh, an example. At the bottom, it shows how um, this DRAM commands are, can be organized in a normal memory. At the bottom, how how they can be organized in a in an approximate memory. So in a normal memory, a uh, read RD command uh, must be issued no earlier than 12.5 um, nanoseconds after the preceding activation command, which is called TLCD. So in this uh, figure, uh, an ACT and a TLC, an ACT and RD are apart uh, by like 12.5 nanoseconds. But in an approximate memory, you can maybe shorten this um, value to let's say 7.5 nanoseconds because um, many uh, because uh, real uh, measurement on real chips in a previous work found that um, by doing this you only observe uh, a few uh, bit flips in uh, amongst uh, many many memory cells uh, so another uh, timing constraint is uh, about the refresh commands where uh, which uh, refreshes uh, uh, memory cells from from losing data because they are very tiny capacitors and they uh, lose data as time go by as time goes by and in a normal memory a memory row must be refreshed with an interval no longer than 64 uh, mic millisecond. This is uh, again specified in the JDX specification, but uh, some of the previous work, works found that um, this can be extended because many, many memory rows um, can retain data for more than 64 uh, millisecond. For, for example, let's say you can just uh, you, you can prolong it from 64 to 128 or even longer and it just works fine. Uh, so this is how you uh, reduce um, uh, how you reduce the latency, but at a cost of um, um, some increased bit error rate. So an um, important characteristic characteristic of this is that uh, the level uh, the granularity at which you can control the level of, of approximation, or in other words, approximation granularity, cannot be less than four kilobyte, uh, which is a typical raw size of DRAM. So the reason is that the um, many memory cells must be operated in parallel to catch up the speed demand because, again, the CPU is much faster than memory, right? So if you can do, uh, control this, uh, uh, the timing constraint uh, cell by cell, like bit by bit, uh, you can control the error rate uh, per bit, but unfortunately, it's not the case. So, for example, this figure shows how an activation command of DRAM works. So uh, the circle shows uh, the memory cells. Uh, which are organized as rows and columns, and the the black 
uh, cells show uh, have the value of one and white cells have the value of zero. In each row of the, the arrays, the memory array is connected through a word line and each column is connected through a bit line. So what happens if you want to read a, that read a piece of data from this memory is that uh, you first uh, select one uh, row and you enable the, the word line corresponding to the row. For example, in the, the second one from the top in this uh, figure. And then the uh, electrical charge in the cells uh, are start, start, start leaking to the bit lines connected to the cells. And then they um, change the, the voltages of the, the bit line. For example, in this example, the, bit, the voltage of the bit lines are first set to VREF, which is the reference value. But after uh, uh, connected to, to the cells, they, they change to, to X or Y. And then uh, after 12.5 nanoseconds, they uh, reach up to VF plus, which means uh, the value is one, or VF minus, which means the value of zero. Uh, it takes up to 12.5 nanosecond, but we can reduce the, the, this time to, to from 12.5 to let's say 7.5, and we can kind of uh, still uh, read the data, right? Because uh, as you can see from the, uh, the right side of the figure, the voltages have been a little bit uh, pulled up. So uh, this is how uh, activation of uh, DRAM command DRAM works if we reduce the timing constraint. But as you can see, the point is that uh, we cannot do it bitwise because the cells in each row, which is uh, uh, four kilobyte in a typical case, must be operated uh, at the same time with uh, only one uh, timing constraint. So if you think about using this approximate memory from software, we have to um, partition critical data and uh, approximate data in an application. So here, critical data means the type of data, the piece of data that is not robust to errors. And approximate data means a piece of uh, data that is uh, some, somehow, uh, somewhat approximate to, uh, somehow, sorry, robust to errors. So first we have to identify which part of data in an application is robust to errors. Uh, which actually is another story. So it's a uh, you know uh, big another another big research question. So uh, it's in this particular talk we just assume that we can somehow do it. And then in the second step we have to map the two types of data to mem to to different memory regions that have different error rates. So this figure shows um, an easy example um, where. Uh, there's a matrix whose size matrix whose size is eight kilobyte, and the uh, application do something with the the, the matrix. Uh, we can see that maybe uh, we can identify maybe the variable called size is critical because it's important, and the variable called math is uh, crit also critical because it's a pointer, and the variable variables like the numbers inside the matrix may be approximate, right? And then we can uh, we have to map of them to different memory regions have, that have different error rates. So the, here comes the challenge. So in this example of a large matrix, it's fine because uh, we can have a sick, uh, you know, a, a large memory region that have the same error rate. But what if critical data and approximate data are interleaved in a, in a small data structure? For example, in this uh, example, where a structure called tree node has four members, and one of them called score is approximate. Uh, again, this can be uh, uh, how to identify this approximation. Uh, if a piece of data is approximate or critical is another story, but we assume somehow that we can do it in this talk. And there's a, an array of this uh, tree node, and then how we can uh, position them into different memory regions. That's the problem, right? Because again, the minimum size of an approximate region is four kilobyte, and the size of the, the size of an instance of tree node is, uh, you know, uh, 16 plus four is 20 bytes. So we have to somehow divide 20 bytes to four kilobyte regions, which causes a, a lot of um, access locality de degradation. Or we can somehow convert an array of structures into a structure of arrays. This, which might be work, but which might work, might work but uh, this is ongoing, and we'll talk about it later. So the research question in this work is that: Is this a real concern for realistic application? Because if you don't have such, um, this is a um, made up um, example. If you don't have such a uh, data structure in real world applications, it's not a problem, right? 
So to answer it, we analyze realistic C and C++ code, and the the general um, idea of how to do is that uh, so approximate memory becomes the most useful when data with many cache misses is hosted on it, right? So we can investigate uh, if this type of data that has uh, incurs large number of cache misses have interleaved criticality or not. And the concrete steps are, are like this. So in the first step, we find the cache miss, the, sorry, we find the instruction that incurs the largest number of cache misses in an application and also identify the type of data that this particular instruction accesses. And we call this data type of data as target data type because this is gonna be the target of the analysis of the second step. And in the second step, we apply three criteria we have set up to this data type to estimate if this data type has, an, uh, has critical data and approximate data interleaved. <clears throat> so let's see the, the each steps uh, more in detail. So in the first step, we count the number of cache misses per instruction using a functionality called PEPs because uh, what we want to know is the data type that incurs a large number of cache misses, but you can't do it direct, you can't know it directly. So we used, uh, uh, we, we first uh, observed the in instructions that incurs many cache misses. And here PEPs is actually an enhancement of performance counters that uh, actually use hardware to collect, to collect data, while normal performance counters use uh, software to do it. So because it uses hardware, the skid between the time an event occurs, like a cache miss occurs, and the, the, the time that this event is recorded is very little. So we can actually pinpoint which instruction incurs the specified event, and in, in this case, cache misses. While in normal performance, you can't do it. And the uh, exact command line, we, uh, you can use uh, easily from Linux Prof tool, and the exact command is here, but I don't explain it um, here uh, because of the time constraint. You can check the paper uh, to, to know, to, to, re to uh, you know, how you can reproduce the result. So the result will look like this here from right to left, uh, an instruction and the address of an instruction and the number of the percentage of cache misses that this instruction incurs among all the cache misses. So in this particular example, this move instruction incurs 48.58% of the cache misses uh, among all the cache misses in this uh, workload. And uh, by uh, relying on human labor or myself, we can analyze this binary and compare it to the source code and find that this instruction accesses the uh, variable named arc whose type of arc t. So the target data type of this application uh, is uh, identified as arc t. And uh, there are some uh, notes here. The, the first one is that the same methodology can be applied to C++ as well because there's no type ambiguity in binary because temporary functions are just instantiated with uh, concrete types. Another note is that uh, uh, this method cannot cannot work in some cases. For example, in this um, figure, uh, the function called f is uh, called by passing uh, var uh, references to uh, two different uh, references of uh, of members of two different structures. Right. For example, uh, f is called by passing s1. Dot, the address of s1. Dot v, and it is also called by passing the address of s2. Dot v. So inside the binary code of f, we cannot see uh, if this, uh, if a particular instruction accesses s1.v or s2.v, but uh, luckily uh, we didn't hit this case in uh, our analysis, so uh, it might be rare in general, but uh, it has to be confirmed. But what, what is, uh, what I can say that uh, this case can exist in theory, but uh, I didn't hit this case uh, during my analysis. So the second step is applying the three criteria um, to es qualitatively estimate if the target data type of an application has critical and approximate data interleaved because um, this is just qualitative because definitively telling if a piece of data is critical or not is infeasible because uh, it depends on workload, each workload and also uh, each use case of the workload, right? So the three criteria are like this. So uh, C1 is uh, is the da target data type of an application, a uh, C struct or, or class, because if it's not, um, there's no problem. C1 is if, C sorry, C2 is if C1 is, is yes, 
does it include a pointer and at least one other member with non-pointer type? Because a pointer is most probably critical, and if there's other member which might be approximate, uh, this is a problem. And C3 is if C1 is yes, does it include a floating point number and at least one other member? Because a floating point number is most probably approximate, well, not most probably, but in many cases approximate. And uh, if the other member is uh, approximate critical, uh, th this is a problem. Uh, and here are the examples, but I just skip it due to the time constraint, sorry. So here are the benchmarks we analyzed. We analyzed 11 benchmark from SPEC C2003 plus two graph analytics frameworks. From the SPEC, we chose those written in C and C++ and the, uh, the, the ones with, whose cache miss rate is more than 20%. Uh, and these are the ones selected and the domains and the data set and the, the environment are listed here, but uh, due to the time constraint, time constraint, I don't uh, explain it. I can't explain it in detail, sorry, again. So this is the result. As you can see um, for the spec part, many of them has the target data type as, uh, uh, the, the target data type of the many of the applications are structures. And actually five of them have either C2 or C3, yes, implying that uh, this, data partitioning problem is actually a real concern for this application. Uh, yeah, I'll explain the observations in the next slide. So the observation number one is, uh, again, as, uh, as I said, uh, in many spec CPU applications, uh, the uh, target data type is a struct. This implies that the data partition is a real problem here uh, of these applications. And the second observation is that there's no benchmark whose target data type has both a pointer and a floating point number at the same time. Maybe because we ignore Fortran, which is more often used for uh, numerical applications. And this uh, comes to uh, another question uh, that uh, maybe the programming language and programming style used might uh, affect the suitability for executing uh, the application with approximate memory. And the last uh, observation is that the target data type is a prim primitive, like uh, float and int, in both of the graph analytics frameworks. Um, this leads to another question that like maybe the benchmark domain might affect uh, the suitability for executing the benchmark with approximate memory. Uh, uh, we have ongoing work to uh, actually estimate how harmful is it to partition these members to different um, memory regions, but uh, I have to skip it due to the time constraints. And here the relative work uh, and the conclusion. So you can check the, there are a bunch of work that on approximate memory, but unfortunately, well, not unfortunate, but uh, as far as I know, there's no read to work that mentioned this um, data processing problem. I think we are the first to um, actually investigate it. Uh, yes, that's one of the point. Uh, this is the conclusion and future work. Uh, yes, I'm sorry, I exceeded like one minute and a half, but uh, that's it from my side. You have any questions? I'm happy to take. So thank you. Thanks for thanks for the presentation. So maybe we have time for one one or two quick questions. If uh, so, let me Roland. I'm unmuting you. I, it looks like a raised hand. Hi. Uh, that's a very interesting talk. Uh, but I was just wondering about more the philosophical issues uh, and maybe mm -hmm. two directions one is security so mm -hmm. if you look at things like roll hammer attacks and kind yeah. of thing where, you know, oh it can be very bad that uh doing this approximate memory i don't know whether we'll just make things even worse right uh, so 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 that's question one and then the other question is that you know suppose we think of verification of this approximate pro memory that's going to be another verification challenge sorry what is the second question uh verification Verification of approximate right. what do you mean? So the first question is that- the, the, if, so, so the question is whether your algorithm is now correct or not correct, right? Like, and if, if you don't know anything about how the bits flip and you can't mm -hmm. be sure about how the bits flip, if, uh, mm -hmm. you know, you may have some probabilistic guarantee, but the, the true, verifying true, true. these algorithms and programs, not just the algorithms, true. but the programs themselves may be a challenge. True. So in terms of the first question, I don't have much to say, but what is, uh, I can know is that what, what I know is that uh, as you suggested, uh, 
by doing this approximation, the security becomes a bigger concern because, um, you know, so in this particular example, in these particular examples, um, I say that, uh, let me go back. For example, I say that this um, data called uh, MAT is approximate only uh, from, from the fact that it can tolerate some errors. Uh, by tolerating, I mean like the result will be uh, acceptable, but in terms of the security aspect, I, uh, you know, we haven't considered much. And also I think there's no work that uh, try to connect approximate memory plus uh, security issues. So uh, yeah, I don't really answer the question, but uh, uh, it's an important point, but uh, there's much to explore. So in terms of the second question, yeah, how to guarantee the uh, correctness of the final output is another big challenge. And what people are doing is just using random error models, but that try to uh, inject errors randomly within the data and see if you know this um, error rate is okay or not. But uh, what actually is the case is that uh, the errors are not random. They are uh, strongly localized to uh, weak rows and columns, and um, there are some um, mechanisms behind that. So. Uh, yeah, I'm again not really answering the question, but uh, we have to consider when we find which data is approximate, I believe that we have to consider real error models uh, other than random to, to see if uh, this particular piece of data can, can be tolerated to errors. Uh, yeah.